Hi, Julie Osher, Recipes for a Sweet Life. In a recent video, I made a four-tier contoured wedding cake, and in this video, I'm going to turn it into this castle cookie, believe it or not, a three-tier castle in this case. This castle is also unique insofar as it uses very little icing. All of this very realistic brickwork on the outside is actually made by embossing the cookie dough, and I love this project because of that, because it doesn't involve all that icing mixing and messy cleanup. For the texturing, I use this plastic Wilton brick mat, and I'll talk in great detail about how to use that. In this video, we'll focus particularly on the making of the middle tier and getting all the detail on the middle tier and also on stacking the elements. In a successive video, I'll talk about how to make some of the castle accessories, namely the trees, the rocks, and the flags that deck it out. Okay, so let's start with what you'll need for this project. It's basically a nine cookie project. I'm doing a three tier castle cookie, starting with textured contoured cookie cylinders in the smallest of sizes, which here is two inches, moving up to two and three quarters inches to about four inches. You could do this in any number of dimensions, but this is what I've happened to choose for this project. You'll also need bases to support each of the tiers. And if you want to get really snazzy, you can dress up the bottom tier. I'm going to put a moat on my castle. So I pre-iced a six inch cookie with a, a little bit of a moat and some grass. So this, this base is optional if you choose to do the more decorative base. This project also makes use of texture mats for adding texture to the dough, which is what we're going to talk about next. But be sure you have two matching sides of each cylinder type and you're ready to go. Okay, the first step in this project is to get the texture on the castle sides. So how do I get that brick type embossed texture on it? And that's what we're going to talk about now. Ultimately, we'll end up with a piece that looks like that. We're going to be adding lots of other um, elements, some wafer paper windows and some painting and some royalizing dot work. But let's texture here. I'm working with my gingerbread dough. You could work with another recipe as long as it doesn't have a lot of leavening in it and doesn't spread much because we are going to be contouring this cookie. I have a whole nother video on how to texture large sheets of dough, and so you can refer off to that for more detail. I'm going to do it rather quickly here. I like to give the dough a start, a rolling start here on my silicone baking mat, and then I ultimately bring my texture mat over. I'm using a Wilton texture mat. It's plastic, so I can't bake on this in the oven the way I bake some of my other textured flowers and things in the oven and silicone molds because this isn't oven proof. So I, I do need to work with a dough that doesn't have a lot of leavening in it. But I'd like to roll it to about an, its normal thickness, which is about three eighths of an inch thick. And then gently peel the mat off. You'll notice I did not use any flour on these mats. I, I tend not to have to, and I prefer not to because if I do, the flour gets stuck on the top surface of the dough and it's hard for it to come off. These particular pieces were all cut, I believe, about two and three quarter inches tall. And now I've got it on my silicone baking mat that I'll actually cook it on so I don't have to move the dough from here, which is rather handy. So I do like to roll and invert directly on my silicone baking mat, then cut it simply to the right height. And the handy thing about this is I've got a brick mark, which allows me to do a nice straight line, even without a ruler, but I like to cut with a ruler. Remove the excess dough. And then if your silicone mat is well, well floured to start, just loosen it up here and then lift it onto the cylinder that you're going to shape it around. And I've got that already done so that you can see. So I'll be showing the lifting and moving of it and the contouring aspects in my more lengthy texturing video. Now, the next step is how to get the windows and the little notches in the, the little turrets in the castle, if you will. I think there's an official name for that that's not turret. But at any rate, you want to do that after the dough is on the cylinder. If you do it beforehand, the windows and these little notches will stretch before they're lifted on the cylinder. Here I'm simply using a cross cutter because it has a nice little square edge to get that notch. So improvise in the kitchen. If you don't have a cross cutter, use something else. And I'm cutting it off basically every other brick to make that notched effect. I have a window under each notch and I cut it about three bricks up from the bottom, just so it's roughly centered. And again, I'm using the bricks as my cutting guides. Here's a little diamond cutter that I have from a mini Atiko set. And if the dough doesn't come out nicely on its own, take your handy trussing needle 
and just pull it out. And one more window to the end. You don't want to cut windows too, too close to the edge because when you st start putting the two pieces together, if there's a window cut at the very edge, you're going to have a hard time matching up the brick pieces and it's just going to be much more fragile along the seam. So keep it at least an inch to a half an inch away from the edge. That looks pretty good. Now, it's set in this this little, this is the container for my cookie cutter set. It's set in that, the cylinder, so that it won't roll around in the oven. I'll simply set it on the back side of a cookie sheet, stick it in the oven, bake it at 375 for 10 minutes, the normal amount of time. When it's done, I simply slide it off the disc, or rather slide it off the cylinder, and we're ready to start decorating once the cookies are cooled. Okay, before we start actually colorizing and adding icing and tints to this, the first thing you want to make sure is that your pieces nicely fit together. I've already decorated the back side of this particular tier. This is the mid tier of the castle. And we'll be decorating just the front half and then putting the two together. You want to make sure they fit nicely together and have a tight seam, like so. Normally when they're first baked and come off the cylinder, the edge might be slightly rough. And so you'll want to file it down with a microplaner. This is the reason I said don't put the windows too close to the edge because the filing becomes a little more difficult to do and you're more likely to break something with the window there. But I file the edges until they're completely straight and so they're nicely fit together. These have already been filed. So that's just you want to make sure that you do that. Okay, now I'm going to be working on cardboards here so that I can easily move these around without handling the pieces. Uh, the next step is actually adding a little black food coloring so that we get some shadows on the bricks. And here I've mixed my normal liquid gel black food coloring with a little bit of extract. It can be any flavor, something that marries well with the cookie, as long as it's a clear extract. So I want it to be thinned out so it's not too dark. I we'll want to test this a little bit on the surface. I'm just going to kind of randomly paint it around. That's a little too dark, so I'm going to wipe a little bit off and thin that out a little bit more. And I'm just going to kind of randomly move it around. And I'll probably wipe some off because it is still rather dark. This is just going to lend some of that darker shadowing effect you see on the piece to the left of the piece I'm working on. If it's too dark, again, you can just kind of wipe some of it off. There are many different ways to shadow this and texture this, texturize this castle. My piece here is a little bit that I'm going to end up with is a little more goth, a little more manly, a little more dark. If you wanted something more princess-like, you might choose to do this kind of shading with pink and white as opposed to the colors that I'm working with here today. And again, it doesn't need to be precise here. We want it to look like natural shading, so almost the more random it is, the better. We'll come back to that palette in a little bit. Now the next step is actually filling in the grout. And for that, I'm using a cream icing, cream colored icing. This just has a little bit of brown and golden yellow in it. And it's a, about outlining consistency. So it still clings to the spoon. It's relatively thick. Now there are different ways you could get it on. You could use a clean finger, but if you're not into that, uh, spatula will do a nice job. This is a hard type spatula and this isn't so great because it doesn't have a lot of flexibility. I found that this flexible spatula works a lot better for this task. So we're just going to take a little bit and smooth it in and then wipe off the excess so you get this kind of grout effect. And we'll come back and clean up the windows if we have any filling in the windows in a, in a second. I'm just going to do this all the way around. I like to decorate the halves first before we piece them together because this kind of work is much harder to do when the two are joined. Clean it out of the windows with my trussing needle. Clean it off the edges and I'll just continue all the way down the length. I'm going to clean my spatula and try to give it some final smooth so we don't have a lot of, see how that's kind of rough in here? I want that a little smoother so that we don't have a lot of that roughness showing. And clean out my windows as well. There are a lot in this window here. 
I think that looks pretty good at this stage. Don't worry if there's a little roughness around the window. We're actually going to come in and frame those windows out with a little bit of modeling chocolate. But before we do that, let me put that aside. I'm going to let this dry a little bit and then I want to come in. You see how this has a little bit of sheen on it? I want to give it yet another shadowing accent by um, painting on, or rather dusting on, a little dry gold luster dust. But I want the underlying icing to dry a little bit first before we do that. Okay, that icing doesn't take very long to dry at all because it's relatively thick to start. So it's, it's just dry to the touch and that's all I want so they get a more even distribution of the gold powder. And this is Super Gold CK powder. You can use any gold powder. I'm just going to use it to add some highlights, putting it on rather generously, and then I'll brush the excess off. And again, this is random. Kind of the more random, the better. It just looks a little more natural. I often put it where I feel like I've got heavy dark spots that look just a little too dark, and that'll kind of tone it down, the black down a little bit. Now, if the icing is wet, the powder doesn't distribute as evenly. I've got a little bit of it, more of it clinging here than I would want, and it doesn't come off as easily either. So I could have waited maybe a touch longer for it to, to the underlying icing to dry a little bit, but I think that gives you a general idea of how you might texturize this particular castle side. Okay, now it's time to detail the castle windows with window trim and also add some little flourishes up around the turrets. And for that I'm working with my chocolate dough. I have a whole other video on that. I just like to get it a little bit workable before I roll it through my pasta machine by kneading it in my hands because it tends to harden when it sits for a long period of time. And I'm going to roll it out to the number four the number four setting on my pasta machine, which is rather thin. But I like to do that gradually, starting on the number one setting and then moving it up one, one or two settings at a time. And we've got a nice long piece, both to cut out the window trim and also these long strips that we are going to lay on the edge of the castle. I've got some pre-cut already. I'm going to show you how to do both of those. I like to start by actually cutting out the window with the same diamond cutter I used before and then just eyeballing the trim. So I, I don't want it much more than maybe an eighth of an inch or so. If you find your chocolate sticking to your surface, mine's sticking to it a little bit, lightly dust it with powdered sugar or corn syrup and that should do the job. Because when you m remove the excess pieces, you don't want to distort the window frame. But we've got a nice one there. And then from any long strips, I would simply cut long ribbons for the other elements, and I've got a whole other ribbon making video where I go into that in great detail. So let's start applying these pieces. I'm going to start by laying down, I think this strip here, I'm going to stick it down with a little bit of corn syrup as glue. That's what I've got in this container. Just make sure this goes all the way around. And I'm trying to match it up with this one, so let's bring it a little bit closer so that the strips line up when the two are joined later. Okay, so you want to use as little corn syrup as possible so you don't get a lot oozing out from the front and leaving shiny spots on the cookie. So just enough to make it tacky. Now, I pre-cut these other window pieces earlier but you want to apply them while they're still flexible. You know, if you leave them out to dry, exposed to the air, they will harden and then won't fit to the contours of the castle as well. That window's a little big, so I'm going to replace it with another one that's maybe a little bit smaller. So in order to keep them flexible, if you make them advance in advance, just stick them in a little plastic baggie, and that should be just fine. Okay, with the window frames down, the next step is to add some window backings. The order of operations here isn't so important, but I do like to get the window frames down so I just see how much, how much uh, exposed window I actually have. Now for the windows, I wanted something sheer that would actually let in some light. You could work with isomalt, you could work with wafer paper, you could w work with any number of mediums, but I chose to work with wafer paper just because it's a little easier to work with than isomalt, which is hot sugar, basically. So I'm working with a, a nice yellow frosting sheet. And I'm just going to use my craft paper punch to cut clean, neat little ovals. It's a little faster than just doing it by hand. And that's how I cut the basic piece. 
sometimes they stick in there and you just need to knock them out. But you'll notice on these ones that I pre-cut that I also have some little window panes drawn. And that too is all edible. To do that, I simply take an edible ink marking pen and a ruler and just draw a little crosshatch in the middle. You could draw as many panes as you wanted. I just drew two going directly across using my brown edible food coloring pen, Food Doodler. Many different brands of these those, though. And then to attach them, I'm going to use the same process of sticking them down with a little corn syrup, but I'm going to do this from the back side, taking care not to touch those, really handle the chocolate pieces I just put down because they can smudge when they're still moist. So a little bit of corn syrup here. I'm applying it to the cookie rather than the paper. It's just easier that way. And then from the back side, I can see roughly how well that window is centered in, in the pane. I can also flip it over and look at it too and move it around until I have it nicely centered in the frame. We're going to attach all the others exactly that way. The corn syrup will ultimately dry and those will stay in place. This one's popping up a little bit at the bottom, but it, I'll stick it back down with a little more corn syrup or a little more application of pressure it's sticking up at the bottom. Now I always like to do a final check on this side and make sure they're centered in their windows because that's how it's ultimately going to be viewed. And while the corn syrup is dry, you have a little, uh, wet rather, you have a little bit of time to move things around. Should have cleaned the icing out of this window a little bit better before we put it, put it on. But uh, this one, see, this one's off to the side a little bit, so we'll shift it. And similarly. But I think that looks pretty good. And just to neaten up the top edges of the turrets, a little more chocolate dough. Again, these strips are cut the same way as the one that was cut here. And I'm sticking them down the exact same way with a little bit of corn syrup, which you can apply in this case either to the cookie or to the dough itself. And if they're not exactly the right length, I just come in with my paring knife and lop off the edge if they're a little too long. Okay, with all the chocolate elements and window backings on, I want to trim out these window frames. When I initially put them down, I thought the dark chocolate dough just looked too dark, so I wanted to tone them down. And I thought this might make a little nice accent. So I'm working with gold outlining icing of outlining consistency, relatively thick, so it holds a nice tight line. And I'm just going to pipe a gold line down the center of each of these frames. I'm rotating the cookie a lot because I'm always liking to pull the icing toward me so I can see how straight the line is piping. So that's why I'm moving the cookie a lot. And where there are joints, you know, where, I, I'm, where two lines are coming together, there'll be a little blob of icing, but I'm going to conceal that with a decisive dot of icing of beadwork consistency so it looks a little more finished in the end. Another option, if your hands are shaking as mine are, is to try to prop it more upright while you work. And I'm going to do that here and see. And that allows me to then steady the tip here. And I think that's a better option. And then, as I said, just to clean out the seams so they look a little more neat, I'm going to come in with little dots here. This is icing of beadwork consistency. I also have gold accents at the top, big beads at the top of each turret to kind of give them another little highlight. It's pushing a little bit harder here to make a slightly bigger dot. The last detail are black dots at the top of the turrets in here of beadwork consistency. I'm going to start in the center and move sideways. Doing bigger dots here. Again, you could finish these in any number of ways, but I just thought these little details added a touch of intricacy that I always like. So I'm starting on the dots that I can do looking down, and then I may need to elevate this piece to get around the sides. So as I get down along the edge here, either I need to sit down lower or this piece needs to go up, which we'll do momentarily, but I'm going to trim out the top of the turrets as well while I've got it in this orientation.
Now you could put another row of teeny tiny dots on top of the brown modeling chocolate as I did on this piece, but I'm going to move ahead to assembling this because that's where it gets really fun, putting it on its base and then trimming out the seam with a little bit of vine work. So ideally you don't want to start the assembly process until everything you've piped is completely dry because there's just a chance of it smudging. But we're going to move forward with these two pieces and I'm just mounting them simply on their base here. And this base is designed with a thick royal icing glue. And you can do this one of two ways. You can either pipe the icing on the base of the cookie or, or on the bottom of the castle side as I just did. And I'm going to make sure it's nicely centered. I'm handling this one very carefully because those elements are still wet. And then the next thing I want to do is put the pre-made piece that matches up with it on the back. I'm putting a little glue on the seams. I'm also going to, actually before I do that, let's sit that sideways. I'm going to reinforce with more glue on the inside here just to make sure it's nicely secured. I'm just going to run my finger here to make sure it gets into the seam nicely. You could use that spatula for that purpose as well. Put a little glue down at the bottom. It's okay if a little bit of glue peeks out of the bottom because I'm going to put some stonework down there to hide, hide that seam. And I'm careful here not to touch any of the pieces of the windows that I have piped because they are very fragile and will break. Okay, so Make sure it's centered on the cylinder as best as possible before pushing it together. Now that seam is not great and we want to hide that and I'm going to show you how we're going to do that next. And to do that I am going to need to elevate this piece so that I have it more at eye level. Okay, so this seam isn't great but and it's also very brown so I'm going to fill it, fill it with some of the cream that I used earlier as grout and that'll help mask it. I'm going to smooth it out and then we're going to run a little green vine up the side. Get that on the other side as well. This one is also not the best fit, so we're going to need a pretty ample vine here. And I'm going to fill it out with more grout here than I did on the other side. I usually make a few extra cylinders each time I do this project because sometimes they just come off the form slightly differently and some are a little more wide than others. And you just want to choose those that always are the best fit. Okay, so the seams are somewhat concealed and now we're ready to, I'm gonna, I just want a little more in here. And then I'm ready to put some green vines up the side. For that I'm using a thick royal icing of pretty much glue consistency and a very small tip. I'm using a tip here just because I think I can get sharper lines than with my cone. But I had a number one tip in there. I'm going to use a number two instead because I have a rather big seam here and just cover as much of it as I, more of it with this slightly bigger vine. And it requires a little less force to pull it out. So I'll start down here and just kind of zigzag it up the side. Maybe trail it up and around the top. And then angle vines off to the side if you'd like to. You can use a number one tip, it'll just be a slightly finer vine. And that's what I used on some of the other castle tiers. When we put this together, you'll see I've got a finer tip that I've used on those. Now for leaves, I use the same tip. You could swap it out to a leaf tip, but why take the extra step? So I push to create a little bead and then pull up to create the point of the leaf. And I'm just gonna attach a bunch of those all the way on various sides of the vine. That's a finished vine on one side, which I think nicely conceals the seam. Okay. And I also carry the vine over sometimes to the front face of the cake, which we'll do, of the castle, which we'll do here, just so there's a little bit of green accent, not just on the sides, but also displaying from the front view, because when you go up, you want it, the colors to be somewhat evenly distributed around the castle. I'm just putting a little vine accent on what will ultimately be the front of this piece. 
and I trim out the other seam the same way. I just want to show you how I finished off the base of the castle and then we'll proceed to stacking. Because you're, we're seeing that bottom part, that unfinished gingerbread, I did want to trim it out with some royal icing stones. And these I made little stones were pre-made, much like royal icing transfers, using very thick royal icing, what I call royal icing putty, of different colors marbled together and then allowed to dry. So now I can just stick them on with a little thick royal icing glue. I've got a whole other video where I'm going to talk about how I made, made these coming up next. So don't fear, you're going to be given all the details about how to make them in this size and also in a bigger size coming up next. So simply glue down and they finish off that bottom base quite nicely. And once they're on, allow everything to dry and then we're ready to stack. Okay, so this is the finished middle tier. I'm going to clear this out, bring back the other tiers and show you how to stack it. I've got two pieces already together, so we're just going to put the top tier on, which will be pretty quick. But the process of stacking is the same regardless of the tier. Okay, so I've been busy. I've got two tiers stacked already. I used my moat cookie on the bottom and a bunch of other little embellishments like royalizing trees and the more uh, royalizing rocks and also little fondant and wafer paper flags. I'm not going to go into all the detail of those little accessories quite yet. They're going to be covered in my next video. So we're just going to talk about stacking. To stack these two tiers, there are a number of ways you can do it. You can fill the interior with cookies if you want it completely edible. In this case, I wanted to keep it really lightweight because I knew I'd be moving it around a lot for the photo shoot. So I have a little clear plastic container that I stuck down with royal icing glue to elevate the bottom tier and the mid tier. And I'm also going to use it to elevate this tier that I'm going to put on top. Alternatively, you could cut out a little piece of styrofoam size to come to the top of the tier. So this would have worked just as well. And I'm going to show you one other method for filling once we get this tier on top. Now, I've got my little top tier made and I just want to make sure it's sitting nicely in position here. And it, I always do a little test placement first and it seems pretty good. So the next step is just to glue it down to whatever structure it is, be it a stack of cookies, a plastic container, styrofoam, with thick royal icing glue. And I'm taking care not to handle windows and things because they're completely fragile at this point. I also want to make sure that I've got it centered both front to back and side to side. And it's a little far back, so I'm going to push it forward before the icing dries. So now, before doing anything else with this cake, you could leave it as it is, but I want to put a little flag on top as well. So as I said earlier, you could insert a piece of styrofoam that just fits the top, or you could fill it with cookies, but I'm going to fill it actually with crumbs, ground crumbs. These are graham cracker crumbs, like those that I've got in the bottom. Hopefully I have enough to come all the way to the top. I'm just using my parchment cone as a handy funnel. It just needs a bigger opening in it. And as I said, I'd ideally let this tier dry completely before I did too much on top, but because we're on video time, we don't have the luxury of doing that. And my last step is putting down a little modeling chocolate disc with a little royal icing flag set directly on top. And as I said in my next video, I'll show you how to make all of these accessories. In addition to the castle accessories video, which will tell you how to make the flags, the trees, and the rocks, I encourage you to check out my lizard video. It also makes use of a sugar veil texture mat. It's a smaller project and a lot more easy and accessible, even for kids. Till next video, live sweetly.